Hello, this is Mike at Game From Scratch, and welcome to the second part of our ongoing default game engine tutorial series. Now, in the last part, we looked at uh, basically creating a project, installing all the tools, loading your project, and running it. Uh, so I assume you've already gone through that, you've got the fold set up, you've got the editor open, you've already created a project, preferably an empty project, and today we're going to take that one step further. Now, I'd like to jump in, but there's some key high-level concepts we need to understand first. So that's exactly what this particular um, tutorial is going to be about. It's going to be about how a default game is structured. And then after this, it won't be a long tutorial, so don't worry too much. But once we've got the basics down, then we're going to jump in and get down with the nitty gritty. But it's fundamental to understand how default does things because it does things a little bit differently than other game engines. Very similar in the end, but it's got its own unique way. So it does deserve its own tutorial. So you can get a better understanding of how the basics works before we move on. Now, um, I've already created a project, so you should have already got in your dashboard had a project created. When you created it, you got a choice of bringing in or creating empty. I've gone with empty, so if yours doesn't match up to mine perfectly, you're probably not empty. So um, if you want to follow this step for step, please be sure to do that. Now, once again, there is going to be a text-based version of this tutorial on Game From Scratch. If it's not already up, it will be within a day. Uh, so if you need some of the source code, there's going to be barely any, by the way, uh, but if you need source or um, to go over what I've covered here, it's all available in text as well. So if I lose you a bit, please do be sure to check Game From Scratch. I will link that down below. Now, another thing, touching on source, in this entire tutorial series, Default uses Lua, and I'm not going to be teaching the basics of Lua. Now, fortunately, I've already done this. So if you are interested, I did the Game Dev for Complete Beginners tutorial series earlier, and the first part of that is kind of an introduction to the Lua programming language. And I highly recommend you go through that if you've never used Lua before. It's a very simple language. This is exactly what makes it great for scripting. Um, so this will be part, this is actually linked within the um, uh, the text-based version of this tutorial. So if you do need a, a bit of a brush up on how Lua works, be sure to check here. It teaches you everything you know to follow along with this series. But I'm not gonna repeat myself with that one, so I'm not gonna do a whole new Lua series just because I'm doing a new Lua-powered game engine. So just ignore the log parts, and you'll be good to go. Okay, so back to uh, the default editor. We've got it open, we've got our project created. Let's just go ahead and open our project now. Now, as I said, this is an empty project that I've created, uh, and I've gone ahead and created a new branch. If you haven't, create a new branch now. That's just basically going to, you know, uh, fork a version of it from the Git server behind the scenes. And here it is. Now we're going to look at the Project Explorer. This part's very important. This is the basic building blocks. Now, unfortunately, I don't think I can um, jack up the resolution of this, so this might be a little difficult for you to read. Uh, but you'll notice here we've got um, the built-ins uh, right here. This is where a lot of the stuff built into the engine itself, things like fonts, um, there's some... Um, Texture rent shader, um, sorry, um, oh God, I can't even come up with the word. Uh, there's some shaders in there for rendering textures. There's uh, fonts, and default input handlers, some built in materials, etc. So there's some very handy built in stuff. We're going to cover some of this a little bit later on, but ignore it for now. Also, ignore input. This is used for uh, input mapping in your game. And we'll, we'll come back to that later as well. So ignore it as well. The part that we're most concerned with or most interested in here is main. Now when you look at here is how things are organized and structured within a default project. And at the base level, you've got these folders. This is just a folder. So I can come in here and I go new and I could just create another folder. So you organize things into folders as you like them. It's a nice convenient way to organize things. Later on, you'll see when we get into messaging that it also goes into making part of the URL. But for the most part, a folder is just a folder. It's a way of organizing like-minded things. Now, it's a pretty established convention at this point to use main as the entry point for your game. I will, I'll show you in a minute how this is all actually wired to make this the entry point, but that's what this naming convention of main means. If you come from a C or C++ or a Java background, main should be immediately obvious too. And that's why they just create this folder called main. So this is essentially the entrance to your program, to your game. And now the default game they create for us is very, very simple. Uh, we covered, I think, this in the last video. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm going to cover these things in more detail later on. But basically we have um, this atlas, which is a collection of images with a single image in it. That image is located in this images folder as logo.png. So that's what this atlas is. And we use this in a moment uh, with our game object. And that's the key thing we want to cover today. We want to look at uh, collections, game objects, and components. And those are the building blocks per se. Now a collection, and I'm gonna double click main.collection right here. Now if I go, you can also look, and I can say open with text editor. And you'll see this is actually a very straightforward file. There's not a whole lot to it. 
uh, but if you open it using the editor, you get this nice organized version instead. And so what you can see here, so there's your your two different axes, and that is just an instance of a sprite. Now that sprite you can see right here, and it is from that atlas right there, and the name comes here. Now that part's completely unimportant. We'll get to the details of this stuff later on, but what I want you to understand is exactly this guy and this guy. Now a collection is, um, in this case, a collection is working like a level. So um, your game level or your, you know, you can have your entrance, then your uh, main game and your exit screen, your high score screen, etc. Those could all be collections per se, but that doesn't have to be the case. A collection can also do the role of a prefab. So I can turn in, a, I could create a collection for say my main character and it is in turn a container for um, game objects and game objects in turn are containers for components. Now, if you've ever seen Entity Component System, that's kind of all the rage right now. Component-based game design is kind of the norm. You've got some kind of a, either an entity or a game object that holds components, and default is no exception. So you've got this collection at the top. A collection contains game objects or other collections. Um, and in this case, like I said, it's it's worked like a level. It's got this single game object in it. So at the top here, you see, so the outline shows us what is inside of this collection when we've got it selected. And you see here with our collection, all that we've really got there is a name. That's it. And it contains a single game object named Geo. So I could come up here, right click a collection and add another game object to it if I want. So there you see, we now have two game objects in our world. And I'll now go ahead and get rid of that second one because we're not actually going to use it. So our game object itself, a game object is very, very, very simple. It has uh, four properties and then it contains components. Now the four properties are basically position, rotation, scale, and ID. So it's something that can be positioned in the world and it has an ID and that's it. Now what makes a game object useful, as I mentioned earlier, so you see here, I can add a component to it. So there's these various different components, such as a 3D model, uh, other collections actually, uh, sounds, uh, spine models, which is a, a version of 2D sprite animations. I've got a video on it if you're interested in more. Just search my channel for spine. I covered it actually in some detail earlier on. And then of course, sprite. So you can see here, so I cancel out, this particular game object actually has a sprite attached to it. And the sprite's really straightforward. It's just a graphic. Um, it is now going to be part, so I could add multiple sprites to this game object, I could just add sound files, etc. And then each of these uh, actual components in turn has the various different properties. So you can see here, this guy has an image attached, so I could come here and go, okay, which guy am I gonna use? Okay, the logo atlas. And then within that atlas, which image am I gonna use? Okay, logo. And then here you can see where the built-ins come in. So what am I gonna use? The material to go ahead and render this guy. Well, that's built-in materials, sprite.material. So we go here to go to built-ins, you see materials, and then you see sprite.material. And we'll double click that, and you will see it is the sprite.material is actually a holder for built into material sprite.vp and fp, which, if you've done some programming in the past, these are actually vertex and fragment shaders. So, this is, um, you know, we'll go ahead and actually open those up. So, sprite.vp. So there's the vertex shader that is actually responsible for drawing sprites on screen. So there's where the built-ins come in handy. They make some of the, the menial tasks of actually programming, the stuff behind the scenes, like you know having to create the shader or the fragment shader. Now, vertex and fragment shaders are way beyond the topic of what we're gonna to cover today, but you do have access to them. So if you wanna do some funky shader programming, if you're more advanced or you've already got experience, here's how you see, you could, you could override these easily, provide your own actual shader. Uh, so if I came in here, say I can go new, and you see I can create a material, or I can create, actually I don't know if I can create a shader directly this way, I think I have to do it by hand. But you have all kinds of control, fine level control over how you know an individual entity is, is rendered, etc. cetera. Uh, or like I said, you can use the built-in. So let me go back to the collection here. You'll see if I go to Sprite, it's just using the built-in Blender uh, material for uh, rendering this guy and you don't have to do any additional work. So that's definitely nice. So then a quick recap then. And I will close all this stuff down so that it's not that confusing. Uh, you've got folders, which are just folders, and you put stuff in them. Now, a big top-level organizational unit inside of the default is the collection. Now, collection, as I said earlier, contains uh, game objects and also contains other collections, potentially. And um, now that you've got your game objects, your game object itself just has positional information, and it itself is composed as, or it is basically a container for components. 
and components are the building blocks or the Lego blocks of making a 2D game using default. And that's how everything works together. Now the question you might be asking is, okay, uh, how do I program any of this? You know, so it's nice that we can you know, bring this crap in, but how do we actually link some code up to it? And that's a good question. Now you see in a typical game engine, I don't know if you've worked with the game engine in the past uh, or rolled your own, uh, but essentially behind the scenes, everything has a game loop of some kind. Now a game loop is a really primitive concept, but every game has some somewhere. Now, a lot of times it's hidden away in the game engine, but basically it's a tight loop, something like this. Basically it's like, as long as this game is running, so you actually got things before and after the game. So up here you generally have um, allocate stuff, and then after the loop is done, your game's about to end. exit, you have free stuff. But for the most part, your game exists here. And what it does is it runs over and over and over and over and over again, uh, either at a fixed rate or as fast as possible, and it does things like say, all right, update the game world. If you're running a physics engine, update the physics engine, um, check for any of the input, uh, and now render all the difference. And then it does it again, and then it does it again, and it does it again. And the speed at which this render is called, that's where things like frames per second come in. So if it's being called 60 times per second, so if this loop is going through and render is being called 60 times per second, then your game is running at 60 frames per second. So that is you know, the essence of what a game loop is. And Every single game engine has a game loop somewhere. Now, do they expose it to you? How do you implement it? That's what varies from game engine to game engine. So let's look at the process of scripting your game here. Now, first off, we need to add a script. So here in our main folder, right click, go new, and then just pick script. And we'll give it a name. Uh, all scripts in uh, the default engine have the .script extension. So you see here, this is where it's gonna be creating it. So empty is the name of our project. Uh, content is a built-in URL name, main, and then main is our folder. So we'll leave that as it is, and we're going to call this guy main.script. Go ahead and say finish, and here you can see the end result. So I'm going to do a very simple script in this case, just so we can see how it runs. So print game begin. Okay, so what you see here is a set of functions. These are all callback functions that are called at various different points. So as I said, this is a game loop. So you got here like updating the world, getting the input, render. Uh, what this is instead doing is at each one of these particular points, the game engine is calling back into our code. So it's calling our script. So at the beginning, before everything starts, it's gonna call init. When uh, the game loop is done and it's about to wind down or when this um, game object is being gotten rid of, it's gonna call final. Otherwise, it's gonna keep calling these functions over and over and over and over again. Uh, specifically, update. Now, update is what you are going to use to make things happen in your game world. So this particular uh, script is gonna be called every single frame. Um, this DT value is going to tell it how much time has elapsed since the last time update was called. We'll use that in the future, so don't get too hung up on that. And then you can also see here for um, was a message received, we'll cover this later on, and did input happen? So again, when you see here, so when this get input happens, when input actually happens, it goes ahead, calls back into our code, so we would handle input handling code here. All we're gonna do is put a simple print statement inside of this init call here. And uh, if you're, actually I'll cover that later on. So that is done. That is basically all we need to do. I'm gonna go ahead and save both these things. Now the one catch that we've got though is we've not actually hooked that script up to anything. So we now have a script. You'll notice right here, uh, we have this um, main.script is now hooked up and it's part of our inside of our main, but we don't have it wired to anything. So what we need to do is go back into our collection right here. So we're gonna grab our sprites or we could add an empty game object. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but we've already got one right here. So we're going to go ahead and use it. So we're going to grab this guy. So this is a game object that contains a number of components. In this case, it actually contains one component, which is a sprite. What we're going to also do is add another component to it, but this time from file and just pick your script. So essentially we're attaching our script to the game object that's already in our collection. So what's going to happen is when our collection is created, it's init is going to be called. When it's init is called, it is going to in turn fire off this code. So we have now wired our script to our game object inside of our collection. Let me make sure everything is saved up. Now we'll go up here to the project, build and launch. And there you see in the debug, game began. So that was our code being executed 
right there. I could also come in here and go game ended. And then here, and this one's going to be really nasty because it's going to call a lot update. Okay, so now this will show you the life cycle a little bit better. So let's go back, let's exit out of this guy. Let's do a rebuild and launch. And there you're seeing. So this is every single time that update is being called, you're seeing that particular piece of code firing. And when I go ahead and click this guy, you'll notice on the exit, it's calling that uh, right here. So that is the game loop, basically. It's, it's a game loop inverted. So game loop is calling back into our code. And our code is simply a script that we create and attach to a game object inside of our collection. Now the astute viewer might be going, okay, how does it know which collection to run? And that's a very good question. So why is this main.collection being used? Well, oh, and another thing you might be asking is, well, what the hell are these? This M and this A. Uh, those are attributes from version control. So basically A means it was added and M means it was modified. So once we go ahead and actually save this back to the server, those little guys will go away. So that's, if you were wondering why there's little, little letters next to them, that's what those actually mean. So back to what's controlling all this, well, we have game.project. Game.project is actually a simple little text file. So I'll bring up here a text editor, you can see, there we go. But the nice thing is if you double click it, you get this nice built-in editor like so. And what we're interested in here is the bootstrap. Now the bootstrap is basically gonna say, what is the entry point for this program? And you see here it's main.collection. And you'll see it added the C on the end. Um, I think that just means compiled. I'm not 100% sure what that means. Uh, but this is telling the default engine where your entry point for your game is. So it says when this game starts up, create this collection. So then this guy gets created. This guy in turn holds this game object, which holds our script. And that's what causes it all to work together. That's it. That's really all I want to cover for today, I believe. Um, now, I may have jumped over some points of interest to you. Uh, if I have, please let me know and I'll put them in the comments down below. Uh, so now we've got the basics of how a program all works together. Now we're going to actually jump in and do things like handle input, draw something on screen, update it, you know, game-like stuff. But I thought it was important to understand how collections work, how um, uh, game objects work and how they're a collection of components and how components work together. I think this is a very important thing to understand before going too far. And I think it's also always a good idea to understand, you know, when a program starts up, where it goes, that how these particular pieces all link together, how scripts are work, where the game loop is. Even though it's hidden from you, you should always kind of have an understanding of, you know, how program flow works. So hopefully we covered that all on this tutorial. Hopefully that was useful. Um, stay tuned for the next part. Again, if you enjoyed this series, it's first of many or the second of many. So uh, please do hit like and subscribe. Uh, we do this kind of stuff all kinds of times in Game from Scratch. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. See you all later.